in any conflict. Your fate will depend on your actions. War crimes will be prosecuted. War criminals will be punished. And it will be no defense to say, I was just following orders. Distinguished, distinguished members of the jury of this most remarkable tribunal, distinguished fellow advocates, Mr. Chairperson, dear friends, what we have seen now and what we have heard is the story of U.S. geofascism, U.S. imperialism at work. The illegal U.S.-U.K. Anglo-American attack on Iraq on the U.S. list of atrocities was number 239. Since the beginning under Thomas Jefferson in 1804-05, it is number 69 after 1945. The number of people killed by U.S. imperial incursions in other countries is somewhere between 12 and 16 million. It's a number that compares with Hitlerite and Stalinist atrocities. I mentioned that as a point of departure, and my second point of departure is a little slip of paper on which I have written Article 28 of the Human Rights Declaration. A most remarkable article, which stipulates that everybody, everyone in the world is entitled to live in a social and world order in which the human rights in this declaration can be realized. It's a meta-right. It's a right about rights. It's a right to have rights. That international order that is the structure of the U.S. empire is totally incompatible with it. So what I'm going to now do now, and I'll do it as briefly as I can, is to explore that contradiction and to try to bring it to the jury with, of course, the admonition to the jury or trying to explore it further. Because there are also some gaps in our human rights, let us say, discourses. And I would like to start at a simple point, although it is quite rich in implications. Barbara Tuckman, in her book, The March of Folly, has three criteria of a folly. That it was perceived as counterproductive at its time. It certainly was. From the beginning, when we got the first rumors that the attack on Iraq was planned. That feasible alternatives existed. I'm going to show that. And number three, that the policy was not the policy of one party alone, but was the policy of others, which means that there was more to play on. Well, the Downing Street Memorandum shows us how they coordinated the folly. And I would like to commend our chairperson, Joel, for having mentioned so clearly that in our pursuit to rule out criminality, we are also permitted to attack stupidity. And that criminality and stupidity do not exclude each other. And there is a simple mechanism saying why. Because when you're planning criminal acts, like you did this group, the so-called meeting of the testicles of the cojones, the brave persons commended by Bush for it, when you do that in that little boys' club, you do not benefit from democracy. 
It's a strange little loop organized by itself, listening only to itself. You do not benefit from the gift of listening to others. When you plan criminality, you will become even more stupid than you were from the beginning. Now, where are there alternatives? I'll mention two. There was a French-German approach. It was based on deep inspection. It was based on the idea, they were convinced by Hans Blix and others, that there were no weapons to be detected. But if this is about weapons of mass destructions, let the Americans send over their people. If this is about democracy, Iraq could agree to hold elections within the next two years. One could have hold Mr. Hussein to his words. But you see, that isn't worked. It is not the way the U.S. Empire works. The U.S. Empire has an old strategy which they use repeatedly. They put forward their own proposal, and with the cooperation of the corporate press, in exactly what was rightly termed the military-industrial media complex. They see to it that what the other side proposes is never given prominence. That was the fate of Le Duc Thau in the Vietnam process. That was the fate of the Serbs in the Rambouillet. Their proposal was not aired, not viewed, not seen, not heard, not read. And it was the fate of this one. So then, of course, the other side will reject what the U.S. finally comes up with. And the U.S. will say, you see, they are against peace, whereupon they attack. It's a terrible, terrible plot, a terrible ploy. It's against the human rights to be properly informed. Now, the story continues. The proposals are passed on to senior Pentagon officials, including Richard Pearl an influential Pentagon advisor. Pearl said the New York Times account sought authorization from the CIA to meet with the Iraqis, but the US officials declined to pursue this channel, saying they had already engaged in contacts with Baghdad. Said Pearl, their message was, tell them that we will see you in Baghdad. How that took place, we have seen documented here. There could have been this meeting. There could have been a conference. Of course, you see immediately one rather major difficulty. If Iraq's position and Saddam Hussein as some kind of carrier of the Iraqi state, nonetheless, if the Iraqi position had been that we will talk about US oil concessions, that sounds like quotas. There's only one quote that U.S. was interested in, 100%. If this is about weapons of mass destruction, let the Americans send over their people. Of course they knew there were no weapons of mass destruction. I am not so insulting to CIA that I believe they didn't know it. That they are liars, I have not the slightest doubt about, professionals. But that stupid they are not. From 95, the place was clean from that point of view. If this is about democracy, we can have elections in two years. By the way, I like this little if this is about. It's kind of intellectually interesting. Well, that would be the democracy if it happened. And Saddam Hussein would not be the ideal person to supervise it if it had happened. It might come closer to the democratic will of the Iraqi people. It's not the US democracy. As was pointed out so brilliantly earlier today, democracy may now become another name for the US client state. We are very far on that road already. But the point I'm making now is that we have here sins of omissions. Not only the US didn't take up these leads, as was pointed out by Hans von Sponek, by Dennis Halliday, the UN failed too. And the General Assembly countries also failed. 
they should have had the courage to defy Colin Powell. They should have been able to exchange this terrible U.S. trick. And I heard it from several U.N. ambassadors, that if you don't comply with what we say, we will increase the interest rate on your loan because we happen to control the institution that sets the rate. And that means 10,000 more dead per year or whatever. They have the calculations. Now, the best book about this is recently out, the New York Times bestseller by John Pershing, The Confessions of an Economic Hitman. I cannot enough recommend it. As a matter of fact, it also challenges one of my own concepts, structural violence, because it shows how the US empire consciously, deliberately uses. There is a human right missing here. If everybody is entitled to what Article 28 says, and if Article 2 says that you're entitled to your life, then we are also entitled to live in an order where everything is done to solve a conflict. We know a lot today about how to do it. It is not that difficult. The diplomats do not know very much, nor do the statesmen. But you have an enormous amount of NGO experience accumulating in this field. Things can be done. That NGO experience is to conflict resolution what Amnesty International is to human rights implementation. It's coming very quickly. So we're dealing with basic acts of omission, and we're dealing with the duty to implement Article 28 by setting into order, by moving processes of conflict resolution that are nonviolent. I move now on to the second point, briefly, the biggest one. If the empire, and not only the US empire, any empire, is in flagrant defiance of Article 28, then it is our duty to undo it. How does one undo the US empire? Let me give you four ideas. Let me first give you my definition of empire, which is very boring and very social science. It's a trans-border structural arrangement whereby economically exploitation, military killing, political repression, and cultural conditioning are synergistically coordinated. It's not Marxist. It's another definition. Personally, I would tend to see the culture as the basic factor because that's where legitimacy is embedded. But the Pentagon planners some years ago put it much better than I have done. The de facto role of the United States Armed Forces will be to keep the world safe for our economy and for our cultural assault. It's an interesting word in connection with culture. To those ends, we will do a fair amount of killing. It's in official documents. Now, whether 12 to 16 million is a fair amount of killing or bordering on the unfair is something I don't think we in this hall are in doubt about. For this, they need legitimacy. And they draw on two sources, basically. They draw on democracy and human rights for whatever they can get out of it. Although they themselves are the ones who always refuse to ratify social, economic, and cultural rights, the covenant from 16 December 1966, thereby signaling to the world that these rights are not to be taken seriously. And they draw on the source that they are accountable to, namely God. And it works this way. The United States people was chosen by God somewhere around 1620. They were given a promised land, and they then developed a pattern whereby they elected a president. That means you get a very tight relationship between God, the U.S. president, and the U.S. people, a kind of holy trinity. Now. 
I used to say that God chose the United States and United States chose the United Kingdom. And that's the way the system has been operating, the Anglo-American. It's a little bit too soft. Today I would say that a God that chooses George W. Bush as his instrument is not the God that deserves our attention. And to configure anything, any concept of God in that way is a blasphemy. I call on the jury to call on the Pope, Benedict XVI, once known as Joseph Cardinal Ratzinger, the one in charge of the protection of the faith, to denounce this as blasphemy. I'm not myself a Christian, but my Buddhism is sufficiently close to the soft Christianity of Francesco d'Assisi to feel insulted. This is a blasphemy. I call on Christian communities to denounce it because this is their major source of legitimacy. Tony Blair was an evangelist in his younger years with his beautiful smile knocking on doors or knocking down doors and singing the gospel. I have been told, I don't have a photo, it would be nice to see the photo, that the two bees have been praying to get it. A highly blasphemous act. Now compare that with the Downing Street Memorandum. What are they doing? We have been seeing today, I'm particularly impressed with the two presentations, right? We are heard right now, US democracy at work. Now, <clears throat> are there other ways of doing it? One should rip the carpet away from them when it comes to their use of theology. Of course, it's essentially the Southern Baptist Convention. It's essentially the Southern States. It's the Anglo-Saxon population in the Southern States and the eastern part of Texas. The western part is already better. It's essentially that they have won the Civil War. Yes, yes, they won it. They are in power now, and they are celebrating it, and they're making the most of it. What is a little bit sad is to see how much of the rest of the U.S. is capitulating to them. Now, there is another way. Economic boycott. I would ask the jury to consider economic boycott of US-UK products abroad as an appropriate civil society punishment. We are not in a position in this hall to admonish governments to administer the tribunals against these atrocities, the Anglo-American atrocities. But we are in a situation to inspire the civil society to do so. U.S. corporations abroad have an average profit of 6%. A boycott of 6% is sufficient. Some sources I have tell me that even 3% will work. Because the board of trustees will be caught between their loyalty to Washington and their loyalty to their own wallet. That second loyalty is lasting and endurable. The first one is a little bit more flimsy, goes up and down. Now, the point is that if you pass by an S or a BP station and go to a company that is slightly more decent, it's very difficult to bomb you for that reason. But the government cannot do this. The threats of the U.S. empire are too credible. The number is 240, is too high. And I also know particularly well that there is nothing that makes the U.S. so angry as those who once were their friends and then looked like they have turned against them. The list is long. Pol Pot, Saddam Hussein, Mohammed Ajid, and so on. Milosevic was one of them in a certain sense. Now, why is that? I think it is theologically inspired. Satan was one close to God, but Lucifer organized some kind of revolt against God. I never quite understood what it was about. It must have been interesting, especially if it was Bush's God. And down he went 
to something that looked very similar to the caves in Afghanistan. In other words, if you have once been on the payroll like a bin Laden and you turn against, then you are the worst, you are Satan's ilk, not only ilk, but it is proven in the Bible that you are. I was once visiting professor at Duke University and University of Virginia and passed twice a week in a car through Lynchburg, Virginia. The name is not very promising, but the point about it is that in Lynchburg was a center of the theocratic fascist right that was mentioned by Larry. And I had lunch there twice a week in order to be brought up to date with the latest about Armageddon. They were living on biblical time. These people are now in power. Very, very dangerous. An economic boycott is a language they understand. You can have as many moral declarations as you will. We can declare them criminal. They won't pay any attention to it. Not at all. 11 million people in 600 sites is thrown away in the dustbin by George W. Bush as a focus group. Okay, yes, we are somewhat focused. He's right in that one. They don't pay any attention to meanings, to moralism, to critiques. But to an economic boycott, they will pay attention. A boycott would comprise consumer goods, capital goods, and financial goods. When you have an alternative to a Boeing aircraft, take another plane. The Boeing Corporation is the world's biggest death factory. It beats Auschwitz by several factors. Now, there is no need to use the dollar as a tourist currency. For an American Express card, there is a very good measure. Scissors take care of it immediately. It is possible to divest. It is possible to encourage corporations and others to divest. It is possible to pass that gasoline station. It's possible not to drink a single bottle of Coca-Cola. And fortunately, there is now a Chinese product coming on the market, which looks suspiciously similar to Coca-Cola, but at least it's not produced in that place. Its name is Wahaha. You may find it a laughable kind of name. Uh, we'll see what kind of success it will have in the future. What I am saying is that you can combine this with girl cut, with rewarding other countries, or rewarding the good U.S. corporations. Lists exist. You can be a total boycotter. You can be a partial one. But you can send a signal that there is a limit to which we want to cooperate with U.S. economic imperialism. Now, what I would suggest for the jury would not be to recommend necessarily all-out boycott, but we'd be to recommend that any person in the world picks the level of boycott that he feels comfortable with. And at the same time, keeps the dialogue, keeps the contact with our beloved friends. I can intone with Gore Vidal, I can say I love the US Republic and I hate the US Empire. Just as I can say that I love Norway and I hate Quisling. I love Russians and I hated Stalin. Politically, what can we do? Look at Lula, the Brazilian president. Slowly putting together what will one day become the United States of Latin America and the Caribbean. Look at what happens in Africa. It's no longer organization of African unity, it's African Union. Put together by Mandela and Gaddafi. Look at the OAC, the Organization of the Islamic Conference. I can share with you a prediction. That C will in some time no longer be stand for conference, but for countries and then for community. Look at the call a couple of days ago from Malaysia to constitute a Muslim economic community. 
That will be from Mindanao to Casablanca. Look at the European Union. Right now it has some little problem. All of these are regional efforts partly based on the need and desire to extract themselves from the U.S. grip. Things are happening. And I finish by the military aspect. We hear references to the U.S. as the strongest military power in the world. Forget about it. There is no way in which they can win the struggle against the Iraqi resistance. And I would add to this that not only is all resistance against that evil legitimate, but I will also express my gratitude and my sense of humility. You are fighting not only for Iraq, you are fighting for all of us. I would add a footnote which you will not take in any negative way. If you had added, if you could add to your repertory of resistance, nonviolent Gandhian type techniques, you would be even more efficient. And I say that blaming ourselves in the peace movement, we have not been good enough at communicating this. We have not been good enough establishing the contact with our brothers and sisters, giving more insight into the possibilities. I conclude with the following. There is the US empire, there is Article 28. There is on the one hand the absolute need to institutionalize in human rights form and maybe also in human duties form that every citizen in the world is entitled to live in a world where everything is done to solve conflicts. In my own experience with about 60 conflicts around the world, I have not yet found one single conflict party, even the US, that doesn't have some legitimate point. You sit and talk with them, and there is a little glimmer of legitimacy. You build on that one. You build bridges between the legitimacies. It's entirely possible. And the second point to the jury, find the form, the means, and the ways by which we can resist. Resist legally, even as a duty, an empire that makes a complete joke of everything we are struggling for. And that is so nicely expressed in Article 28. Thank you so much.